Well, hello again, everybody. This is John Norris at Trading Perspectives. As always, we have our good friends Sam Clement and Courtney Truss. How are y'all doing? Good. good. How, are you? How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you for asking. You know, last week we talked a little bit about the upcoming holiday shopping season. And this week, you know, I've been noticing a lot of stuff in the headlines that perhaps is maybe not ho, ho, ho all the way and doesn't make me all that jolly about the holiday shopping season. It seems to be the world has a lot more of what's called provocations going on right now. Like you know, hypersonic missiles? Hypersonic missiles. <laughs> hypersonic missiles. <laughs> Missiles by Get the right chi- Chinese, you know, that's kind of concerning. And nuclear missiles that can go six times the speed of sound, that, that I find that kind of concerning. You know, was yesterday or the day before, the Russians shot down a satellite in outer space that uh, would have been so much Star Wars back in the 1980s or even 90s. And, uh, you know, even stuff like the Iranians uh, buzzing our, some of our ships with drones. And yesterday it was a helicopter. And the Belarusians are causing issues with the Polish border. And the, and the Russians are imagining. Passing 100,000 troops at the Ukrainian border. It just seems as though there are just a ton of different flashpoints going on around in the world right now. And that's no way, Sam, to start off the holiday shopping season. No, it's definitely not, especially if you're, you know, a male in your 20s or so. <laughs> so, so that brings me to the point. Here we are, post industrial United States, 21st century global economy, uh, the world's eh, arguably biggest superpower. A sole superpower. I mean, the way the, the way the Chinese and the Russians have been beefing up their militaries recently, uh, they're 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 making a push for that. Yeah. So, what do we make of the new world order? Of some of these provocations that are out there, these flashpoints. What are we willing to do as Americans to ensure that the Pax Americana, American supremacy around the world, maintains? Because here I am. I'm in my fifties. Um, I've got a son who just who turned 20 yesterday. Uh, Sam, you are of perfect conscript age. And Courtney, you have small children. Um, so we're looking at this at various points. Uh, points. What would happen if the situation in the Ukraine does become more of an issue and all of a sudden NATO has to go fight against the Russian bear or if the Chinese with their massive naval buildup, it invades Taiwan? What are we willing to do as Americans to say, no, sir? Uh, I don't think much. I, I, personally, I, I think Americans' appetite for going across the globe to countries and and fixing problems that you know maybe impact us down the road but don't directly impact us, I think there is not much appetite for that anymore. And I think yeah. we've seen that with um, how hastily we pulled out of, of countries recently. So, I mean, so you, you're the con- conscript age, right? I yep. mean, you would be drafted. You don't have children yet and all that stuff. Yep. Healthy healthy male, ready to, ready to fight, and it doesn't sound like you'd be really terribly willing to fight. Well, I think it's different than some other experiences when we, we had drafts, and I think you have to look at why uh, we, we went to war. I think, I mean, we were attacked. Our country was attacked in World War II. Pearl Harbor, it was a direct impact to us at the time. And so having draft, I think that's part of why people were so willing. Also, I think it was a generational thing. But besides that, I think people are more willing to go fight for their country when their country is being attacked and their livelihood is being attacked. You know, it's a little different if, say, Taiwan is, is being invaded or something in the Ukraine. You know, it's like, I don't know if I want to go, go fight for that. I don't know if you'd want to go send your son to defend Ukraine or, or defend whoever. I mean, it just it's, it's a hard sell, especially with some of the wars we've had recently and the amount of bloodshed that there's been for kind of nothing. Right. All I right. Mean, well, that ends this. <laughs> this I know, exactly. But Courtney, I mean, you, undoubtedly, with your small sons, you would probably be. Wait a second, Mama Bear. The U.S. really doesn't have that dog in the hunt there. The, I mean, the Russians in the Ukraine. How does that really impact you here in Birmingham, Alabama? I mean, wouldn't that be hard to kiss your kiss your boys goodbye and send them? You trying to make me cry on the podcast? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah. No, I couldn't imagine that. And I mean, what's crazy is that you look at a war that we were in for 20 years and think, to Sam's point, what came out of it. I mean, I don't think that our job as Americans is to police the world. But I do think that we have to protect, potentially, hopefully, that we could prevent um, any type of attack on our country, not let it get to a Pearl Harbor um, situation with advancements in technology and stuff like that. But, yeah, no, I I definitely would not be for um, my children 
but, being in that. So I don't even want them to play football, let alone um, just because I don't I mean, like You the, might just have to move out of Alabama. You know, but <laughs> they can, you know. Hey, they can watch it, and they can be the kicker. But uh, but other than that, I do not want them to play football. But, that you know, it's just a matter of protecting your children. And I think it's a very honorable you know, for people to be in the military, and I'm very thankful for their service. We have um, veterans in our family, but that is just, of course, I don't want my children to put themselves in harm's way. But I think being the world's superpower, I think there is something to say for, you know, fighting other battles or, or, mm-hmm. or helping out. I think, you know, I don't, I, I don't want, you know, just tons of American citizen young men to be sent over to every country and solve every problem. But it's, it's hard to ignore the fact that if you're the superpower, if you're the strongest in the world, that you kind of, you know, chip in here and there. That you, It just seems kind of inherent in the term superpower, that, that it's not just so being a recluse. we should just be second. We shouldn't be first. We should be second. No, I think we should be first. To do <laughs> but, but I don't think, especially now, that that means physical bodies being sent to well, other places. I mean, I mean, we're the financial superpower. Yeah. Everyone We're still the military money. superpower, I would argue, for the time being, and and, and playing a part. I, I, I mean, I, I think that's part of being the largest superpower. Well, you know, I'm Sam, I think you're right, and Courtney, I think you're also right, and uh, I, I would say really a lot of a lot of why we feel this way as Americans, arguably, is because we've gotten some sort of fatigue over the last fifty and sixty years, and obviously you all aren't fifty or sixty years of age, and I'm not sixty. You know, it's fatigue from the Vietnam War. It's fatigue from the two Iraq wars. It's the fatigue from Afghanistan. It's fatigue from whatever whatever sort of brush fire there has been, kind of going, what did we accomplish in some of these areas other than dead bodies? And, and, and kind of make things worse in some areas. Oh, yeah. And so, and so, you know, I was talking with John about this, I mean, a few years ago, back when he was in high school, and I said, you know something, it's, uh, it's kind of hard to sit there and kind of, kind, of, kind of explain what's going on in some of these areas, particularly when we're not exactly sure what the clear U.S. interest is in some of them. I mean, truthfully, I mean, yeah. I, I had a hard time with them. I mean, truly, I did. Um, and with the, some of the flashpoints now, you know, people were up in arms at the that the Iranians were buzzing of the USS Essex in the Gulf of Oman yesterday. Well, why we have a helicopter carrier carrier ship over in the Gulf of Oman? You know, I mean, that's close to Iranian territorial waters. And and what would it really impact citizens in say Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, if Beijing decides it wants Taiwan back? Or yeah. if, you know, Ukraine becomes part of greater Russia again. Yeah. You know, and so how is that going to impact putting food on the table here in central Alabama, making sure that your kids don't play football? And that's that's a message <laughs> message that I'm not sure Washington has sold to the American people very well. Right. And I think there is some nuance to it. You know, I don't think it's necessarily a black and white issue. I think it goes back to us being the superpower. It's like, yes, that doesn't mean we need to go fight everyone's battles and send tons of Americans over there. And maybe it means we just need to help financially or, or, or what have you. But I think there's definitely nuance to, you know, I think you have to look at each issue or each war or what, what have you kind of individually and, and weigh the, the consequences of it. And I think it's important that we do step in if it's just like overly... I don't know. I mean, just ridiculous of human rights violations and stuff like that. I mean, we do financially give, I feel like, a lot to foreign aid. But just making sure that we are stepping in and make that, you know, if if Russia was slowly taking over more and more and if China was slowly, you know, I mean, that we wouldn't want it to be something that we ignored until we couldn't ignore it any longer. But it seems like we do that. It seems like we ignore a lot of things and and, and ignore, you know, other kind of powers and, and... don't really want to stir the pot on some issues. But, I mean, I think it begs the question, like, is it our job to defend democracy? Just general democracy, wherever it is, is that our job as a superpower, the largest superpower, the largest democratic country? You know, that's a great question. I would say the vast majority of Americans for a very long period of time would have said yes. Yeah. Would have said absolutely yes. But I would say really over the last 20 years, maybe we have 
kind of dimmed in, the, in that view. And Probably because, since Vietnam. Right? Well, since Vietnam, but I mean, more importantly, really over the last 20 years, the war on terror, what, what's going on in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. frankly, the way we got out of Afghanistan uh -huh. um, has really maybe dimmed some people's view on this. But just little things, Sam, you kind of were talking about the selective nature of uh, how we've intervened, intervened in some areas. So people can make a very coherent argument that, you know, the U.S. doesn't care about Africa terribly much. I mean, they had the huge, uh, what they call Af African World War, uh, with, in the Congo with everyone getting yep. involved and millions of people displaced and, and, and died and perished. We have a kind of a major war going on right now between Ethiopia and Eritrea, but that doesn't hit the headlines terribly much, and yet we don't really uh, participate in that. So if we are going to be the world's superpower, it seems like we need to exert the force completely across the globe or maybe maybe kind of outline what it is we want to do. Right. And, and and that's where I think we are with this. Before before Washington says, Sam Clement, guess what? Report to boot camp. And uh, they tell you, Courtney, in a few years, hey, get your boys on ready. Get them all signed up. And before they send my son out, give me an idea of exactly what success looks like. And y'all y'all right. you, have heard me say that. What what does success look like? <laughs> Plenty of times. Plenty. You know, what, what does success look like? And right now I am not sure if anyone in the United States can say they know what success looks like in terms of our foreign policy and the and the force that we exert around the world. And this isn't necessarily a Biden administration thing. This is a long time coming. Right. I, I think the last 20 years, you know, pretty much all the conflicts in the Middle East we've gone through, I think that's a perfect way to put it is it's like, what is what is success here? You know, it seems like, you know, even the last couple of years in Afghanistan, it, it was Okay, if we pull out, pretty much everything collapses here. So, so what is success for us? Is it a permanent presence in these other countries? And I don't think many people want that. Yeah. Um, but it's also, did we come over here, pull out, everything goes back to how it was, maybe even worse, and, and we lost lives for nothing. But do you feel like that's um, a lack of trust in our government now more so than maybe in the past where people would – you know, rally behind the government and just trust in what the government said. If they said we were going to war, you would trust that it was in the best interest of the American people. Because I feel like in World War II, people, I mean, and on the flip side as well, you had a clear enemy. Like, right? I mean, Pearl Harbor, you could tie that back to Japan. Whereas with 9-11 or when we entered Afghanistan, and there were a war against terror you didn't necessarily have a set country, a set demographic that you could obliterate. Um, well, you know? I think part of it's the further away we get from that event. And, you know, I talked about, we've talked about Pearl Harbor and that being an attack on us. 9-11 was an attack on us. Okay. And, and I think there was, what, one member of the House of Representatives who, who voted no against yeah. going to war then. So it, it was a consensus thing. And I think I think we would still experience that if there was other attacks on our country. I think the issue is boil down to go in places whether that's our job to go defend other countries defend democracy in other countries or or just defend against you know any sort of genocide or what have you just evil across the globe and i think that's people are kind of getting turned off to that in a lot of instances and it's understandable why uh, understandable because really we can we can get the information so much more rapidly than we could back in the 1940s um, and also, you made a very, very important point. There has not been an attack on, on, on the U.S. in a long period of time. And you could, uh, people could say, well, because we have all this presence uh, elsewhere, then that's the reason why. Yeah. Uh, but that still doesn't come up with a, a reason for for you to go, Sam. Hey, I guess what? I'm, I'm going to put on the put on the body armor and I'm going to go. Right. Go off it and, doesn't and resonate as yeah. much. Saying, well, people losing their life in the Middle East is preventing something. I think you're right that I think a lot of times it is. I think it's prevented a lot. Um, however, it, it's just hard to resonate with people as much as an actual direct attack. So so what do you what do y'all think would happen? What, how do you think the US would respond if all of a sudden Beijing just decides, okay, we're gonna take over Taiwan. And then they, they invaded Taiwan. And I don't think it would I mean wouldn't take that that long, no. really. No. Um do you think we would do much more than a token show of force and then and then get out of that? Or do you think we would kind of rally the same way we did on September 11th in Pearl Harbor? No. Or so no. essentially. I, I, 
they it's did, hard they, for me to imagine that happening yeah, now. I agree. Um, not even just with this administration, more so the appetite that American citizens have. So do you think, uh, do y'all think that, I mean, here we are in a red state, a very conservative state, um, that is generally pro, pro-military for all intents and purposes. Yeah. And if we're feeling like this in, in our state, how do you feel the remainder of the country would feel? Well, I, I think it's almost become sort of a bipartisan issue. It feels like getting out of, of areas. And, you know, the argument has more been how do we get out of certain areas or do we leave some? But, I mean, it seems like the overarching consensus is that most people on both sides of the aisle are pretty against just sending U.S. citizens across the globe. I yeah. mean, that, that, that seems to be my take. It seems like that's not the argument. One side saying, let's keep them, let's send more, and the other side saying, let's pull everybody out. It's kind of the, the, the nitty-gritty, the details within getting people out. And I think, I mean, part of it might also be, like, what would affect our bottom line? To your point, John, when you were saying, like, okay, well, who in Idaho or wherever, you know, cares about what's going on in Asia necessarily? Well, listen, I mean, people in Idaho might care. I mean, I just, <laughs> I just throw that out as just... Whatever. <laughs> whatever. So I'm just pulling on the whatever. But, um, you know, it, it just begs if it was somebody cutting off supply chain or our access to something or it was affecting our bottom line, as well as, you know, to your point, Sam, your physical safety, right, if they were attacking us. I, f- I feel like those are two different reasons in which people might pay more attention or actually care. But if it's not affecting us necessarily directly in our daily lives... I feel like, I mean, at least for me personally, and that might be something bad, but I'm, I'm so much in my bubble of trying to just get through the day with a lot of children and work two working parents that it's, you know, I, you don't necessarily worry about something that's not directly affecting you. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, absolute a ton of truth to that. And I think that's, and because we have such a 24-7 news feed in our, in our country, I believe that these, you know, Xi picks up on this. You know, Lukashenko picks up on this. Uh, I can't pronounce the fellow in Iran's name. <laughs> uh, that Putin picks up on this, and that's the reason why we're seeing more of what I would call provocations yeah. and um, from foreign powers exerting a little bit more strength uh, than than you know what they might have done previously, and probably even be this way regardless of who the administration is, just due to the fact that Americans are weary of wars without end. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and and potential of sending their loved ones off to fight. I mean, it's like, I mean, you know, you see Wounded Warrior Project and you see people, I mean, even around the Birmingham area that have been disfigured by wars in the Middle East and ultimately go, what's it for? So I think how we how we ended up getting out of uh, out of Afghanistan, uh, how that all those Gulf Wars went down, uh, went down. I think it's really ultimately turned a lot of Americans off to being the, the policeman for the world. Yep. Yep. Gordon, you disagree with me on that? No, I, I strongly agree with that. Well, we're not trading perspectives at all. Maybe a little bit of a downer topic, but at the same time, we thought it was kind of important and kind of interesting to kind of share this with you all because we're going to be reading more about this uh, in the papers moving forward. I don't think that I don't think any of us would say we think the Russians are going to stop being Russians or the Chinese are going to quit being Chinese or the or the Iranians are going to quit being Iranians or, or what have you. Um, and we need to be prepared mentally uh, and structurally if and when the Russians decide they want the Ukraine back. Yep. Uh, if and when the Chinese decide they want Taiwan back. What success looks like. Yeah, yes. what does success <laughs> look like for, for the U.S.? Yep. How can we save face while still not losing a bunch of lives? Yep. There you go. All right. Well, guys, thank you all so much for listening. We always love to hear from you all. So if you have any comments or questions, please, by all means, drop us a line. You can always reach us at tradingperspectives at oakworth.com, or you can leave us a review on the podcast outlet of your choice. As always, if you're interested in hearing more, reading more of what we have to say or how we think, you can always go to oakworth.com and take a look underneath the Thought Leadership tab for all kinds of awesome information. All right, gang, we'll give you all last chance to say something about this topic. That's all I got. Yep. That's all I got, too. Y'all take care.